Swain Event, SwainEvent.com, fueled by Daddy Barbecue. We go to the Irish Network's hotline and connect with our guy, Chris Burks, ESPN. Does a great job calling baseball, and man, did he call one uh, this weekend between two top programs, Tennessee and Florida. Chris, good morning. Good morning, fellas. How, how we doing on this Monday morning? Man, we're great, man. We led with baseball, man, because baseball is getting it done yeah. right now. Yeah. Well, you're you're you're, uh, you're you're giving the people what they want, man. The, the fans are kind of into Tennessee baseball right now. It, it brings a smile to my face. Winning, man. People on winners. No, that's it. Simple as that, man. Tony Vitello's a winner. This this baseball team is 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 winning. So. Uh, Chris, I'll I tell you who's winning. Hey, Swain, who's winning are the Vol creatures, oh, the yeah. Lindsey Nelson legends. They <laughs> are winning. They have got – I've never seen – you know, I don't know how many is in that group. It doesn't look like more than about, what, 75, 100, maybe, you know, 50 to 100 uh, kids up there. I, I don't know if kids is the right word. They look like college students. Uh, but they are big time – under the skin of of the Tennessee opponents right now, it's pretty it's pretty interesting to watch. Oh uh, yeah, the the Florida players look man, they look they look they look triggered. They look they like they, they're 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 looking over their shoulder. Um, man, baseball man, such a game of focus and and concentration. Well, you tell me, Swain. I, I, in football, it's almost like white noise, right? Like the fans are far away. There's so many people. I mean, how many times did you actually hear like? exactly what somebody said no, it, Tennessee, at, when you were at Tennessee. Not really much, not unless you're, like, on the sideline or, or you know. Like, Florida, yeah. the Gators have their 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 sideline, their student section is, like, kind of right behind the bench. And so okay. there's moments where you can you can hear them, um, you know, dead ball, something like that. Um, and if someone says something, you know, say the right thing or, in, you know, in this yeah. case, the, the worst thing the to you, thing. you can yeah. catch it. Um, yeah. But it, it really is all white noise. Um, yeah. Whereas in baseball, there's so much time between pitches and the fans are closer. There's not as many. I mean, you know, so it can get – now, I don't – I certainly don't condone, you know, anything that that's ugly. And it'd be interesting to know how they're policing that because I haven't been there to see. But I'm going to tell you, L- the LSU coach, Paul Maneri, had a lot of words to say about how much that group got in and under his kid's skin. And then it was obvious this weekend the Florida Florida kids were responding regularly, so those guys have those guys have definitely brought an edge to the Lindsey Nelson environment. That's for sure. Chris, if you if you Paul Maneri, the LSU coach, are you are you even like publicly saying what he said? Never, okay, never. So no, like... I and mean, you're the head coach. That's like you know I love Paul. He's a fantastic guy. He recruited me when he was at Notre Dame. But like LSU baseball is. Alabama football they're Kentucky basketball like they're the standard bearer for the league um so to comment on a visiting environment is a little odd considering and obviously we're in a COVID year so things are weird but like LSU has traditionally has the biggest home field advantage in the league Mm -hmm. you know so it's just it's that caught me off guard for sure so so Chris on on the show when we have this hot we have this hot key and you know you, you you're not a spring chicken so this right here would uh resonate with you you know this this song right here you remember this you, you know what this is all about oh yeah oh yeah oh you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know you know you know what that all about I don't matter if you can dance if or not like if you hear no, this I'm song with you. I'm yeah, with you you I'm moving with you. a little yeah. bit yeah yeah for sure so I created that because. Um, it's for hype trains. You know, we, we tried to use it a little bit during the football season at the beginning, but uh, it fell off the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're very careful about when we use it. We used it a little bit during basketball at the beginning, but, you know, yeah. that fell off the tracks a little bit. But we're trying to be very cautious now, um, mm. at least at least Ben and Tony Vitello is. I don't – I'm ready to roll, man. I'm, I'm Swain's full. Swain's being reckless. Man, I'm full speed, man. I'm full speed. <laughs> I'm full speed over here. Tony – and Ben, over the last couple of days, was like, okay, I don't know. I don't know if we're the fourth base team. I don't know. Pump the brakes a little bit. After this weekend, uh, Chris, can I can I can I pump the pump the speed up a little bit, or do I need to slow well, down? Here, here's the deal. You know, nobody has orange or glasses than me, but I, I in baseball, I 
I do. I can't take my orange goggles off and look at the team. That's what they pay me to do. I try to do that. Doesn't make me always right, but it, at least I try to do it without my goggles on. I w- we were talking about this yesterday. We had a rough one yesterday. We had Auburn, Mississippi State. Mississippi State scored ten in the top of the first. Ugh. So we had a lot of time to talk baseball yesterday on the air. And if you look at the top four teams in the league, top five teams in the league, the, the you know Arkansas, Ole Miss. from the West and Vanderbilt and Tennessee from the East, you look at those five teams, the other four, maybe, maybe in a way that gives you a little more assurance that they're all going to be there at the very end, as far as the league championships concerned, have something they can really hang their hat on. And with Tennessee, you know, they've kind of got this, this mysterious it factor to them right now that you just, you, you go, okay, what, what, what do they hang their hat on weekend and week out in the league? And, and right now what you'd say is that there's a ton of belief in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and they, they, have a, they have a knack for closing out games. They have a knack for getting a big hit. But um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, as they move into the second half of the season, can you lean on it all year long? I don't know. I mean, I'm not downplaying their players, but they lost their number one, Jackson Lee. He's not coming back. You know, I'm a little worried. Sean Hunley's, I think his last two outings, he's given it up, right? Um, and so that that gives me a little bit of pause. Yeah, they, they could have swept that series very easily this weekend. So I love Tennessee. I love what they've got going. I, I think they're going to be a problem in the tournament. But I, I still probably have a little bit of pause of can they can they win the league? And again, if they don't, that doesn't mean they can't get to Omaha. I'm just I'm I'm trying to pump the brakes on you just a touch, if that's okay. Just that's a fine. Touch. That's fine. I, I'll, okay. I'll dial it back about about ten miles per hour. <laughs> Chris, well, so that's where I'm at, and and we'll find out this weekend, right? Because I yeah. will say this, Vandy. Is human. We've seen them bleed. I quoted Rocky Ford the other day, right? He bleeds. Like, we now have seen them blink, and we've seen them blink at home, and we've seen a team in Georgia that is not, you know, one of the top five or six teams in the league uh, really give them a hard time this weekend. So, you know, I think really the rest of the league, not just Tennessee, but probably the rest of the league was encouraged to know that somebody could do that to Vanderbilt's pitching. Chris, kind of looking at the the Tennessee Vanderbilt series this weekend, do you think it's a a good thing for Tennessee or a bad thing for Tennessee that Vanderbilt lost to Georgia? And when you look at what kind of both teams do well, how do you think those teams match up? You know, first of all, Vandy's got some position players out, right? Isaiah Thomas, their center fielder, has been out. Uh, Cooper Davis, their left fielder, has been out. Um they got another kid out with a handmade bone. So they've got some pieces missing offensively. If you notice, their offense was not the same this weekend that we've seen most of the year. And I don't I have not heard whether those pieces will be back. That being said, I would not – I would rather face Kumar Rocker when Georgia did than when Tennessee did because <laughs> Kumar is going to be on his game. And I promise you, the uh, I don't think the Vol creatures are going to affect Kumar negatively. So – Swain, this is something I think that's going to be must-need TV uh, this weekend is to see the interaction between uh, that first baseline group and and Kumar Rocker. That that's going to I, I've got the games Friday, Saturday, so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a good thing. By the same token, I, I think as hitters, it's always comforting when you've seen other people do it, right? So for Tennessee, they've played Georgia, they beat Georgia. And so for Georgia to have beaten Vandy in a series, I guarantee you that gives Tennessee um, some confidence. Tell me the se- remind me of the second part of your question. Just kind of what each team does well and how you how you see them matching up. Yeah, so for Vandy, I mean, it's rocker and lighter. Uh, it's number one and number two in the draft. I mean, we're, we're seeing college baseball history. That's never happened. I think everybody thinks that it will happen. So, for Vandy, they hang their hat on the two best starting pitchers in college baseball. They run them out there at you one and two. um, And they really, they try to kind of steal your soul with that. Um, 
But the offense is athletic now. They, they've got a kid, Enrique Bradfield Jr., that's playing uh, center field, left field, depending on their lineup. And he's leading the league in stolen bases. He, was, he had a chance to be a first, second-round pick last year in the draft. He's special. Where's number 51? Bats left-handed. Kind of gives you an each row look. Uh, and then their shortstop, uh, Connor Young, is a left-handed hitting kid that, from, I hate to say it, but he kind of reminds you of Dansby Swanson a little bit, uh, but hits left-handed. I mean, he's got star written all over. And then Dominic Keegan um, leads the league in a bunch of categories. So they, they're offensive. Their pitching kind of steals the headlines. As far as Tennessee, uh, you know, the, I think the frustrating thing is that Ferguson and Pavoloni have not gotten going. And it, it, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not really sure that they're going to as far as play at an All-American level like they were projected to play. Now, Ferguson is still really doing it from an on-base percentage, and Pavoloni's doing fantastic behind the plate. But those two guys not performing quite as high a level offensively shortens the Tennessee lineup. Uh, but Liam Spence, I, if, if you're new to following Tennessee baseball, Liam Spence is the shortstop. He's been DH in here a little bit because of a hamstring injury. But he's from Australia. He's leading the league in average. He's leading the league in on-base percentage. Uh, he has been a fantastic story for Tennessee baseball. So he's definitely one to watch this weekend. Chris Burke, ESPN here on the Swain Event. Swain Event Fuel by Dead End Barbecue. What is it about Tony Vitello um, that we are seeing this program transform? Because it wasn't like Tony Vitello came in with an extensive uh, head coaching background with a ton of victories beside his name. You know, the previous coach had all that, had a, uh, you know, championship, and you just, you know, you just thought it was going to be a, a grand slam. And we've seen in football where, you know, Tennessee's had some multiple coaching changes and all the fans are like, just just go swing for the fences and go back the Brinks truck up and get a guy that's proven. And, you know, right. baseball program did that um, and it didn't work out. But, you know, you bring in a guy that's, you know, never been a head coach but, rec- you know, recruited lights out uh, at Arkansas. But what what has it been, man, that's – that's allowed Tony to really catch catch you know fire here so yeah. far in his career. You know if there if there's one thing that first of all he hired Frank Anderson, which has been just a, a huge hire. He, it's an older, wiser, been through the fires kind of guy, and he's one of the nation's best pitching coaches. So that was the first home run thing that he did. The second thing is, you know, I, I think if Tony's proven anything, he's proven that. A connection to the head coach is a big deal in recruiting. And so Tony got the job because of his incredible resume. And, you know, Arkansas baseball has been in kind of a glory run over the last five years, and Tony's had a huge piece in that. And what he's done is he's take he didn't get the job and say, well, I got the job because I'm a great recruiter. Now I'm going to hire recruiters, and hopefully they bring me players. He has still taken the lead, him and Josh Elander, in recruiting. And so – even though Tennessee's facility is way behind their peers, and I'll say that one more time, way behind their peers, because the head coach recruits, because the head coach initiates relationships and fosters those relationships, kids say yes to relationships. And they think it's really cool when the head coach is in on the recruiting process and they will overlook a a program that lacks recent success. They'll overlook a – facility that's way behind the other teams in the league and they'll say yes and when you look at the fact that you know he's gotten Garrett Crochet and Pavoloni and Ferguson and Rucker and now he's got Beck in right field and he's got this Blade Tidwell kid uh and Jackson Leith and all these kids that he's brought in all you gotta do is look at the draft and see how many players Tennessee's had picked over the last couple years and it'll happen again this year you realize he's done it in recruiting and that might be a little bit of a cliche answer but it's just the truth And then as far as the style of play, he's brought back the stolen base, which I love. But I think just in general, he has a connection to this age group of kids that he gets that you have to let them have their own identity and personality. They're not lawless. They're not running around off the field. But between the lines, he has let them really own their own swagger and kind of gain their own momentum as far as their own identity. Uh, And they play – it looks like they play for each other and they have a, a bond that carries them late in games. And I think you've got to give him a lot of credit for creating and allowing that culture. You can just watch Drew Gilbert run around 
if, yeah. if you want an example of allowing them to kind of go out there and and do their thing, Chris, if my favorite. if if Tennessee were to reach Omaha or, or make a run in the tournament, uh, finish you know top two, win the league, uh, it, do you think in terms of improving and, and kind of you know uh, reassuring some some different uh, parts of the team would would you look at maybe trying to find an extra arm or two in the bullpen, uh, and that's assuming that Sean Hunley and Redmond Walsh uh, get get things figured out, and, and then also in addition to the bullpen, kind of trying to find a way to uh, get Evan Russell and, and Connor Pavoloni and Max Ferguson get them going more consistently. Are, are, so, are you asking like what what are the keys for them to get to Omaha? Yes, if if they are yeah. going to live up to this hype that has. That has been generated by them starting the season twenty seven and six and nine and three in SEC play. Are you looking at the bullpen and kind of uh, more consistency at the bottom of the lineup? Well, the, yeah, the the bullpen. I would say certainly Hunley. You know, I, I'm sure they're hoping this is a blip on the radar, but the bullpen has been a huge piece of their story. Their bullpen. I mean, you might have heard me say it on the broadcast Saturday night. The, the the biggest difference between them and Florida is the bullpen. Florida's lost a ton of games late. Tennessee's won a ton of games late. Um, and you got to give the bullpen a bunch of credit for that. So the bullpen needs to maintain slash Hunley kind of refined it uh, for Tennessee to keep it going. And then, yeah, on, on the offensive side of things, I mean, can you count on Liam Spence getting on 500 at a 500 OBP clip the whole year? Probably not. Is he going to hit 400 the whole year? History tells us that's pretty hard to do. Only, only a few have done it. So, you know, at some point he's going to level off and – Ferguson's got to get going, and I love the confidence that Tony showed in putting Ferguson in the two hole this weekend um, because he does draw so many walks and gives you so many tough at bats. But you'd love to see him going. And the Pavoloni thing is that has got to be frustrating for them because last year he was off to a fantastic start. I know that there were people, you know, Henry Henry Davis for the University of Louisville and Adrian Del Castillo for Miami, and Con- Connor Pavoloni. Those three catchers were considered like the cream of the crop. And and Del Castillo and Henry Davis are doing their thing, and Pavoloni did 200. Um, I mean, Henry Davis might win the Golden Spike, you know, and to start the year they they were all kind of lumped together. So I know that's been frustrating. They need to get Jordan Beck going. I think he's a kid that could, like, carry him for two weeks. He's that talented. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Evan Russell's had big hits. Drew Gilbert's had big hits. Rucker, I think, is going to continue to do his thing just because I really believe in him. Uh, they need to get Spence back healthy so they can get Durkay back in at DH. I think that lengthens the li- lengthens the lineup a little bit. Uh, but again, guys, it, it's it's a little bit of a balancing act because as great as they've been, they don't have the margins that say Mississippi State or Vanderbilt um, have or Arkansas has with that just dominant pitching. So that's the piece that you're a little concerned about. Chris Burke, Swain Event here. Um, Chris, I, I know, I know, super, super busy, man. So I, I won't hold you uh, long here. But if, if you're Tony Vitello and you're playing arguably the best program in the country this week, and you know they've been they've been you know slapped across the face and brought down to reality just a little bit, and I'm pretty sure that's what they needed. I'm pretty sure Tim Corbin is telling them, or yeah. he feels like, okay, that, that that was what we needed. You know, we're probably feeling yeah. ourselves way too much and. You know, need to be brought back to earth, and um, you know we've seen championship teams, you know, have these moments in the season where they lose, and and you know it humbles everyone, it makes everyone look in the mirror, and and and, and put the foot back on the gas. But if you're Tony Vitello, what are you telling your team that they have to do to win uh, this weekend against Vanderbilt? Well, I think you're again, you're using the Georgia series as confidence. To say, hey, look, we beat Georgia. Georgia beat Vandy. There is, you know, because I, I do think going into last weekend. And you know, Swain, the one thing I love about young athletes, they don't need a lot of confidence boosters. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like if you ran Tennessee out against the Braves tomorrow, half their lineup would be like, we could get these dudes. You know what I mean? Like, it's mm-hmm. just, there's something about them, right? Uh, by the same token, Rocker and Leiter, that, that's a different animal. I mean, you're talking about two kids. I mean, Jack Leiter could be starting the All-Star game in two years. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's that kind of arm. So, it is a different animal when Vandy comes into town. So you do need to show them the film. You need to show them how Georgia had all that success. You need to let them see the fact that these guys bleed a little bit. Um, 
And then from that standpoint, um, you know, you, you, you got to execute probably more so Tennessee's pitching versus Vandy's offense. Because let's be honest, Rockers, your, your best bet is you're going to get two to three runs off of Rocker and Lighter. Like, both of the – I think Rocker's ERA is now up one and a half, but Lighter's is well below one. So, Jeez. you know, can you figure out a way to split games one and two and then try to win game three? Vanderbilt's proven that they are human with their third starter, and the bullpen's just okay. So I think the goal would be, guys, can we figure out a way to, to work a walk, somebody hits a two-run homer, and we can pitch against this offense enough to win a two-to-one, three-to-two kind of game. We just need one of them on Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday, it's on. Sunday, it's apples to apples. And, you know, you're working against a much more college-like team than you are on Friday and Saturday where where they're running two big leaguers at you. All right, Chris, last question, man. I got to know this from you, man. So, so, uh, probably about, what, two months ago, I think I went – and, and cop the cream Vols cursive baseball jersey. Um, oh, you know, I got hooked up with the with the orange one. Uh, it's a little tight. It's a little tight. A little medium. I barely <laughs> get, I can barely get one arm through it, but it's 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 all good. I still possess it. Um, what is your favorite uniform right now that Tennessee baseball has? It got the smoky gray. Man, it got the 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 pinstripe with the power T. Uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite? Setup? Man, those cream, those cream ones are nice. I mean, super nice. Um, and and the orange, I feel like they finally nailed the orange. You know, when I was at Tennessee, we had like four different colors of orange. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they really the all orange. Uh, they've nailed. Um, so I'll say cream, and then the orange top for me is is probably two. Uh, but the 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 orange hat with the cream tops uh, for me are are. As good as, of course, I you know I say that on TV. I get I get dog for for being a homer, but you know I, the one thing I try to tell people: you can be a homer and something can also be true at the same time. Correct. Right? Like Tony Vitello, I can say that with my orange goggles on that he's the coach of the year, and that also can be true. So uh, I'll say that about the cream the cream unis. Um, and I will say I know Danny White's got a lot of things to do in his first six months on campus, but. I won't name the names. I won't name the jobs. But there are probably two jobs in the league that are coming open this year. Um, and when you've got a young coach who's had the turnaround that he's had in short order, the way Tony Vitello's done it, people will be coming. And here's the thing. Even if the biggest jobs don't come for him, the jobs that are left to fill those jobs might come for him. And so I just hope that Danny White makes it very clear to Tony. I mean, Tony's a grown man. He's going to do what, what he thinks best for his career. But I just hope that uh, Danny White makes it very clear to, to Tony that how much Tennessee values what he's done. And I hope that's in the form of a contract extension, and I hope it's in the form of getting our facility up, up to speed. Because, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't start the arms race in the Southeastern Conference with facilities. It's not. I didn't do it. Don't blame me. But I'm sure there's plenty of people that come to Lindsey Nelson and think it's great. But, man, if I took you around the league, you'd be like, what? Like, what? Now, 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 so, hold on, Chris. You can't, you, I, can't, I, can't, I can't let you get out of here dropping that now. I said that the, <laughs> the question about the jerseys was the last question. Now, what, what can we do? Like, what can we do, you know, Dropping more money is that's that's nothing. I mean, Tennessee has plenty of money. I mean, we've been paying coaches not to coach here for yeah. for a long time. So money's <laughs> money's not a thing. We pay coaches not to coach. Exactly, money ain't a thing. Let's I heard, make sure we pay the ones to coach. Exactly. Well, I heard Jermaine Dupree and JG say money ain't a thing. So we we got money. <laughs> all right, but the 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 setup around Lindsey Nelson and the things around Lindsey Nelson. What like what realistically can you do to improve? the the setup here um, on campus for Tennessee baseball. What what can well, you do? Well, they've they've had the plans for a while, and so you know, let me just say that what I'm about to say is not not new under the sun. But as you know, I, I've I've pl- spent plenty of time uh, on on thinking and and dreaming about what that Tennessee facility could look like. Number one, Swain, they can't even take recruits through the main door. They can't even go through the main entrance of the stadium because it's that bad. It's that much of an eyesore. 
It, I, I, I think I've said this to you before. I can't believe the football coaches have allowed the outside of Lindsey Nelson Stadium to look so bad because it messes up their hype videos. Like the, the background of their hype videos mm-hmm. look bad because of how ugly Lindsey Nelson Stadium is from the front. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're looking from center field out, like, I mean, in, like, towards the stadium, the brick and the rod iron, that looks pretty good. But, you know, we've got a, a, a – I don't even know what you call our press box. There are no luxury suites. The grand entrance is not grand. It's, it's, it's concrete. It's, it's from the early 90s. I mean, it just looks awful. Uh, but if you could redo the entrance, you know, brick, rod iron, throw some, throw some history up there, and you could redo the press box, put about three suites headed down each foul line, right? Three suites coming off of a, of a legit SEC press box. And then to me, one thing I think they could do is really cool. You have one of the biggest advantages in the SEC in that frat row is up your right field line, mm-hmm. right? Like you've got all the kids that want to hang out in the springtime, outdoors, having a good time. They could do something behind the right field wall where you've got that kind of parking lot. You've got the road that kind of runs back there. Build up something like you see at Ole Miss or Mississippi State where you've got students have an area to congregate and enjoy the outdoors and watch the game, a berm area, some sort of student section, and make from the left field the, 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 the kind of terraces that they've built in left field bring that all the way around to right field and enclose the stadium. And then the parking lot in left field, like where they've got like the maintenance entrance and all that, that should be green. That should be for families. That should be for outdoor living. Like put some grills over there. Make it an environment, right? Um, and I think you could do it and stay right there. And, it, you know, I don't know what the number is, 15, 20, 25 million. I don't think you need to tear it down to start all over. I think you could do those things. Um, but just remember – Kentucky's been to one Super Regional ever. They've never been to Omaha. They just spent $50 million on a stadium. Florida just spent $60 million on a stadium. Bama has recently spent $50 million on a stadium. South Carolina already had the nicest ballpark in the East. And then the West, like Arkansas just spent $27 million, and they were already the best. Like, Mississippi State did $40 million for an upgrade. They didn't even start over. They just upgraded the new dude. They got a condo in left field. Like, it's, I'm just telling you, like, we're so far behind the times. It's not even funny, yet our head coach has a top-five team, and he sits in first place four weeks into SEC play. So there is a lot to be done. Again, I didn't do it. I didn't start the arms race, but I'm just telling you what's out there. And if we're going to keep Tony and we're going to ask him to have a top 10 program, we got to give him the toys. Every other program has the toys. Yep. Certainly men's basketball has the toys yep. and football. It's, it's as good as anybody in the country. So, you know, it'd be nice that baseball gets in the conversation. I got an idea, Chris. I got an idea. Uh, I, I think that you and Danny White need to have a conversation. I think Danny White needs, needs to call you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find Danny White's number. I'm just going to drop him your number and just make the introduction. Y'all need to just chit-chat and talk because you got some really great ideas. And I'm pretty sure Danny is, is and this is what I've heard, forward-thinking, you know, new age. You know, I've heard that too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, you know, he's cutting edge, uh, outside the box. Uh, and so I think – a conversation need to be had between be, between you two. I mean, you only called games on ESPN and only played <laughs> baseball here at Tennessee. Was a legend and you know played in the major leagues. I mean, I mean, it ain't like he did anything. So, I well, think- I would love to have that conversation. <laughs> and Tony and I have had that conversation. Um, and so, but what I know it is for Tony is he's trying to coach his team. You know what I mean? And so he's got his nose down trying to coach his team, and I'm sure he doesn't want to be begging the AD early on and asking and asking and asking. So, yeah, I would love to be that liaison for him because I certainly know what it, what it looks like out there and how far behind we are. Uh, and whether my ideas they go with or not, I, I at least have some and maybe can get, get him thinking. But, if I, you know, I have heard that about Danny. It, it does sound like um, he's, he's a guy that's open to, to, to pushing the envelope, and I, I certainly hope that's true, and I, I hope he – makes a, a hard push to lock Tony up. 
And it means something a lot. It means something when you have fans, and I see it all the time, man. Especially in the last couple uh, weeks. Hey, hey, hey! Let's 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 back up the Brinks trucks. Let's keep Tony pay him, pay him whatever he wants. Like that's that's what you like to see, man. What, what, you know, with your fan base. And, and, and let me just say for for context, I'm, these are broad numbers, okay? So don't hold me to this. But uh, I think Tony makes like half a million bucks, okay? The best make a million, okay? So the gap there. You know, in, in football, if you're full, what's Hypo making? Three and a half, okay? So, you know, t- the, the difference between Hypo and Saban is a, is a giant leap. It's the Grand Canyon, it's right? Five million, the yeah. difference between Vit- Vitello and O'Sullivan, who just left town, it's a half a million bucks. It's 600,000 bucks. So, you know, even to get him to that next jump, 750, 800, is, as you said, a, a very small deal when you consider the fact that, it, like, aren't we paying Kevin Steele that for, like, a, a month or something? Yeah. So, um, that's that's the context of, of the jump you make in baseball. It's a much smaller jump than you than you have in these other sports, Man. relatively speaking. Man, good stuff. Good stuff, Chris. Man, this is this – is, this is fun. Ben's over here. Ben's a baseball guy, like baseball guy. You know, played high school, serious, has a you know, has his favorite major league team. You know, has been covering Tony really, really closely ever since he got here. Probably one of the few guys here in Knoxville that covers baseball the way he does. Uh, mm-hmm. and so when you were talking, Ben over here was over here shaking his head, you know, just just <laughs> Look, look like he's about to go to sleep. His his eyes was closed because he was thinking about you know what Tennessee can do and, and what they can be and where they need to be. So uh, man, a lot of folks felt the passion in your voice and agree with you 100. percent So, uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to come on. I appreciate you guys giving Tennessee baseball their due, and um, I'm just proud of the guys, proud of the way they're competing, and you know whether they can keep this this pace up or not, who knows? But uh, it's definitely going to be a fun team. And just remember, like Vanderbilt won their first national championship in a year where they finished sixth in the a- in the SEC. So uh, really just getting out of the league and into the tournament, you're prepared to get to Omaha. And then once you're in Omaha, anything can happen. So it's exciting times because, you know, it's been since 05 since we could realistically say Tennessee has a chance to play in the College World Series. And you know, based on their start, it's hard to say that they don't. I mean, they, they, they certainly do. So that, that makes the spring a whole lot more fun. Let's get it. Chris, you'll be on the call this weekend, Tennessee Vanderbilt. And, uh, man, I thank you so much for your time. You do a great job, great ambassador for, for Tennessee. Man, you and Dane Bradshaw represent Tennessee uh, to the fullest there on ESPN on the network. So, man, thanks so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate you. See All you. right, Ben. Go Vols, bro.